Hello all, welcome to Mount View Live, a space where students and graduates like myself can ask questions and inspire one another. My name is Benjamin Lafayette. I hope everyone is doing well and that you are all looking after yourself in this particularly hard time in our lives. However, today I am honored to introduce an inspiration to many, including myself. <laughs> he is an actor, a playwright, a broadcaster, and also the artistic director of Young Vic. So I would ask you all to warmly welcome Kwame Kui Amar. I can hear the applause, I just want to let you know. And, uh, <laughs> thank you for that lovely introduction. It's everyone, oh, it's everyone. There we go. How are you today, Kwame? I'm all right, you know, my brother. L like all of us, I think you said it in your, in your lovely introduction that, you know, this is this Corona coaster that we're on has us holding on to the sides, screaming, other times going, oh, quite enjoy that I'm at home. And then going, ah, oh, when will I ever get out again? So, um, you know, I, 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 I think I am blessed um, and I'm thankful for health. I'm thankful for family and uh, I'm thankful for having a theatre that I can call home. Yeah. That soon yeah. will open up again, I hope. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. It's not your average day out to Fort Park, is it? But um, yeah, we've got, <laughs> we've got, we've got to do every. every. Um, so yeah, but I've got um, quite a few questions here for you, Kwame. So um, whenever you're ready, I'll happily just dive straight in with what I've got. Dive in, bro. Dive in. Perfect. So it's actually quite funny that you mentioned um, about calling a theatre your home, because that was my, where I'm going to start with. Um, and I wanted to ask you how your time has been as artistic director so far at Young Vic. And also what attracted you to the Young Vic and what made you actually want to go there in the first place? A, a, a couple of things. I think my time has been, um, it's really hard to answer that honestly, right? Okay. Because, um, and so, but I will attempt to. That, um, that when I was in Baltimore, Baltimore Century, who's my previous job, within the first year, I, um, we were going to do a capital campaign, rebuild the building, you know, reimagine what that space was. And so I said to my board, guys um let's let, let's go to london let me show you the young vic and uh and i kind of did right and yeah. and they went yeah this is the theater that we want and so the the young vic has been a kind of a, a, an aspirational theater for me um for many years not that i ever sat down and thought oh i want to run the young vic i just i, I just love what david and the team um did there i love the work and i love the ethos of it um I don't believe there's any artistic director, however, certainly not a year and a bit in, I'm about two years in, that should say to you, in all honesty, I am having a brilliant time. Yeah. If they say that to you, I think they're lying or they're superwoman. Yeah. Um, because running a theatre is hard. Mm. You are trying to please many people at the same time. And, and, and there are multiple constituents that ask things of you, want things of you, are pleased um, and applaud you in one hand and another hand you can walk from one room to the next room where people are absolutely upset with you and, 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 and wish death upon your head. So it's, you know, it, it, it's a hard gig. And that's not to say that it's like coal mining, but it's a hard gig. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, I love being a leader. I don't get off on being a manager. Um, and I, I, I love leading an arts institution like the Young Vic. And we've had lots of ups and a couple of downs, but, um, but it, it, I feel blessed to be the AD. Um, I feel really blessed. So on the whole, I'd say I'm, I'm having a pretty brilliant time. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I mean, it's interesting that you said about, um, about leadership, because, you know, I know that the Young Vic is very much focusing on um, the younger generations and also their community as well. And I kind of wanted to just kind of open that up a little bit more as well and just talk to you about um, your feelings towards like focusing on the younger generation and upcoming actors and kind of what your community really means to you as well. I, I, I think that community is everything. Yeah. Now community, there are multiple Venn diagrams and community can mean different things, but I profoundly believe in the community in terms of our locality the community in terms of our acting community and our freelance community, the community of the staff that work there, the, the community of London theatres and the community of theatre across Britain and across the world. So there are multiple communities and multiple constituencies that I think that are really important. But I think if I had to pick one, um, it is 
the community of people who have dedicated their life to telling stories. Um, and that can be from a non-professional to people with Oscars and BAFTAs um, after their names. Um, I, there is, I, I was once, once a director said to me, he said, you know, God's Christmas present to herself is the artist. And, and, and you know, and, and I think that there is, of course, there's something self-serving about that. I, I, you know, I'm an artist, so I would say that. But I think there is something beautiful that everything in the world that we see has sprung from someone's imagination. Yeah. And we get to, we, we, we get to dance in imagination, in our imagination. So looking after the next generation becomes really important. Being able to set up an institution or be part of an institution that, that sees that as part of its core mission becomes really, really important. And it's partly why um, I joined the Young Vic. Looking after the director's program. For me, that's really important. Creating a network and creating um, a, a system for young directors to move from the clear theater of 60 seats to the Maria of nearly 200, to the, to the main space of nearly 500 where we want it to be. You know, being able to, to have a theater that, that sees that as an integral part of its DNA um, is very important to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that you said something so beautiful there about, you know, it's being able to see other people's imaginations because, you know, it's like one of the very few ways to see what someone else sees in the world. Um, so I completely, hear what you're saying and I think that's such a beautiful analogy about um, God's gift being creatives. I think that's that's a fantastic thing to say. I'm definitely keeping that one and putting that in my pocket right now. And keep it brother, keep it brother. I don't I don't need to be quoted. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but yeah you you kind of tapped on tapped onto um, another part of um, my questions that I was going to ask you and you know I'm aware that this isn't your first artistic director job. Um, and I kind of wanted to tap into um, your experience in America um uh first and i wanted to ask you how that was for you and if you can tell us about your time in the states because i know there's quite a few people that will watch this that probably have never been to the states before so yeah just wanted yeah to well, well thank you for that and um, um, yeah the yb is my third ad job my first ad job was to be the artistic director of the world festival of black arts and culture in senegal yeah. which was you know like 53 nations of the world um in a kind of olympics like um, celebration of black and African art. Um, and, you know, and, and with a budget probably about 40, 40 million, uh, you know, and it was, it was, and that was my first time in. So that was a festival. Yeah. And there were you know, maybe 2000 artists. Wow. When I went wow. to America, um, it was my first time running a building. And actually, what was very interesting was in Senegal, I don't speak French, unfortunately. And so I had a translator for my French and my Wolof. And, um, and so I always expected there to be um, a, a misunderstanding sometimes when I would say something. When I got to the States, I perceived that we spoke the same language. And, um, and we do, but, but it has very, very, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies. Um, uh, and, and so actually, what became really interesting was, um, learning to become an artistic director in a foreign land. Yeah. Community in Baltimore meant everything. It's, it's kind of why, why that's kind of hardwired into me. Mm -hmm. and, and my theater was in a space that actually, uh, in a city that was maybe 70% African-American, but only 11% of our, of, our, of our patrons were African-American. Yeah. And so actually trying to, to learn how to serve everyone became a really interesting adventure learning um I, I i lead buildings like a playwright um i i believe in the drafting process yeah i sit down and i if there's a decision to be made i kind of splurt it out and we just explore it like the first draft and then we discuss it some more and then we do a second draft of it and then we do a third draft and possibly by the third draft i'm ready to make an executive decision on it oh, yeah. I'm doing that in a place like America, where when you put people around the table, certainly in my experience, people want to find the way to say yes. Mm -hmm. People want to find the way to say, how do I make it work? And that was really empowering 
as an AD to create a team around me that, that said yes, not yes at everything, but, but said, how do we find the way to say yes mm -hmm. um, as their default, as opposed to sometimes in this country I had found before I left that, that, that we have a tendency to moan and, and to find the way to say, why should we be doing it as opposed to um, how can we do it? Um, and, and though I perceive that that's changing a little bit, um, it was joyous to learn the ropes as it were in a country that, that wants to go get. Yeah. That's, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I think, well, I think um, I definitely can imagine what it's like in, co in comparison to the moaning, the moaniness of British people is uh, go goes coincides with British weather as well, I guess. So, um, so there's that, yeah. but um, yeah, that's, that's the, the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like today is as great as anything. So um, yeah, but that's such a like lovely comparison in a way as well. Um, but no, not along with you being an artistic director, you um, also do a little thing called writing, I, uh, I hear. So um, kind of wanted to talk to you about that as well. Um, and just kind of wanted to talk to you about your experience as a writer, because I know there are absolutely students at Mountview that um, are willing and wanting to be aspiring uh, writers as well, or maybe want to shift to becoming a writer when they're older. And um, you know, some, some, some of the notable things that I um, myself have been in contact with or uh, I'm planning to read is, um, for example, Tree, A Bitter Herb, Almina's Kitchen, and uh, Benita's Place. So um, I just kind of wanted to talk to you about the joys of being a writer and also the difficulties that come with that, because I'm sure there's many like as there are with being an AD as well. Yeah, I, I started, thank you for that lovely question. I, I, I started as an actor um, in, in, the, in this game, and, and I think um, that I love when actors say, I'm now going to start to write. And I, I love it. So I'd encourage everybody who wants to do it to, to, to do it. Mm. And, and partly because I started writing because I, I didn't see the plays out there that represented the things that I wanted in, to see in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so my job wasn't to write a lead role for me. My role was to put the thing in the world that I want in the world. Yeah. Um, and so that became really important. Um, I would say that. The beautiful thing about being a writer is, um, and it is beautiful, is that you get to see that idea that you had in the shower made manifest by people who are brilliant at what they yeah. do. From a lighting designer to the actor. There's not, an act, there's not a, a writer um, alive, I believe, who can look at a show that they've written or a play that they've written and said, I meant every single thing that happens in there. I, I wrote that. Yeah. The beautiful yeah. thing is writing a line of dialogue and seeing the actor breathe life into that. All of a sudden you start cutting lines because the actor brings a three dimensionality into it that you hadn't quite understood. You knew what you were driving towards, but you didn't quite understand it. Yeah. And so the beauty of being able to see this scene that you beat yourself up over three nights in a row to see it through the lens of a director who can actually drill down into what you really think you were trying to say. I mean, there, is, there, are, there are very few things like it that I have experienced. And there is nothing quite like being able to stand at the back of an audience at the end of a performance and hear the audience walking out discussing the themes that you wanted them to talk about. Now you've got to get the art right. If you haven't got the art right, they go, oh, that, that scene was crap or that play didn't work or it was slow or it was blah, blah, blah. So you, you might have all of those things, but if you get the art right on the whole, the audience leave thinking, ah, I want to talk about that thing that was placed in the belly of that text. Yeah, of course. The hard thing, and so uh, forgive me, I, I, I've spoken about the beauties of it. And let me speak about what I think are the, the hard things. The hard thing is much like an actor is rejection. It's dealing with, at wherever, whatever level you're at, the someone not getting what you've written, someone not enjoying what you've written, mm -hmm. someone rejecting what you've written 
someone finding a flaw in it that you went, oh shit, why didn't I find that flaw before I came outside naked and said to the world, hey, look at this thing. Uh, you know, um, I, that, that, that it is hard. It is, there are moments when you're, and some call it writer's block, but there are moments when you just need to type so, the, so that the energy can come back in. I call it my typing moments, not my writing moments. Those are the scenes that you look back on the next morning and go, oh my God, I wrote that. But it's a, a, but it's a, a catalyst for, for another direction of travel. It is a hard, hard gig. Mm. Um, and it's an exhausting gig. But I would say that ultimately writers are born. They are seldom made. They are crafted, mm. but they are born. Yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think that section in itself, I might have to like crop this bit and then send it to my writer friends because, I, yeah, honestly, you put it so perfectly. And like, you know, the writer's block is. I mean, I'm not a writer personally, but that's such a term that I've heard from friends a lot, just kind of being like, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And I think you kind of saying go the other way, typers. It's it's type like just keep typing is yeah really lovely way of putting actually so yeah no thank you for that um definitely but um you mentioned there was something that i wanted to pick up on as well and you mentioned it briefly then about uh, when uh, an audience member walks out and they're chatting about you know your work and what their opinions are on, on everything and i kind of wanted to touch upon that and ask you what you ideally want your audience members to, to feel when they leave so, you know, do you want them to typically feel educated or moved or inspired or, or is it really depending on the piece or is it kind of like a blanket of all the above, really? I, 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 I think it's specific, right? I describe myself as a generative, interpretive and curatorial artist. Um, and, and, and so there are different, uh, there are different um, joys in each one of those. So as a generative artist, well, there's a theme that I've put into the work that I've generated, and I want the audience to come out speaking about that. Mm -hmm. I think as an interpretive audience, uh, uh, artist, that I try to interpret the work of someone else, and that there is something that they want people to do, which yeah. is either laugh or cry or be angry or go out and do something good in the world. And that my job as the interpreter of that is to make sure that that message is crystal clear and that the audience are leaving that i've served the artist's vision yeah. and then as a curatorial artist actually i look upon that more within a three-year kind of span which is have i given the multiple audiences that come to the young vic or that go to baltimore center stage or to senegal have i given them over a period of years in enough to chew on. Sometimes it's just like, it's a comedy that I put on and I want you to feel joy. And other times I want you to feel pain. Others I want you to look at yourself and go, can I do better? Should I be doing better? And so actually there's a, a canopy of, of things that I want you to feel over a period of time. And I and, and suppose sometimes you get it right. Yeah. And, and, and people do that and other times, uh, you don't and mm. people leave talking about the thing that you got wrong um, but ultimately that, that's what I'm going for I'm going for people leaving the theatre feeling the thing that we wanted them to feel when they came in yeah absolutely yeah no that's that's such a good point I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've left you know a show a play or, or some musical theatre and you know I, I feel like I'm quite a overthinker in that in this essence and I'm kind of just like oh I'll have a, I'll, I felt this and I felt a little bit of this and I felt a little bit of that kind of like I'm going around a posh diner just kind of like taking bits and bobs of things so um yeah no I, I completely hear what you're saying with that and I think that's you know if, if, if you're if you're creating something to have you know uh, a, a story to tell that that's what you want to get across to your audience and I think that's absolutely. I mean, that's really brilliant yeah absolutely so I'm, I'm actually gonna kind of go have to take a hard left on you now Kwame and go, go. ask you where you were born. Oh, great. So I, I, I was born uh, in an area of London called Southall, mm -hmm. uh, which is in West London. If you've flown out of the country, you've flown over the place I was born, because uh, Heathrow is just around the corner. Uh, and I was born into a magnificent, warm, brilliant 
home mm. that 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 even when I look back now still thrills me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was, you know, it was the love, the love that was in that home. And, and primarily for my mother, though my father too. The size of my mother's heart was, was that of, of the Atlantic Ocean. Actually the Pacific, because that's much bigger. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and it was that love that allowed me to deal with the pain mm -hmm. of... Um, of the streets of London outside of Southall that were very, very cold and extremely racist. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I, I was also going to ask if you felt like um, living in uh, Southall influenced your like yourself as an artist. And I feel like already I'm, I'm getting that kind of um, vibe from what you're saying already. Um, and I know that it, yeah. it definitely influenced some of, some of your writing as well, didn't it? Yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, I, I would say growing up in my house is the thing that influenced me most as an artist. Yeah. Um, you know, my mother would have church on a Sunday. My father would have parties on a Saturday night with his boys drinking rum. I would move between the room of the church on the Sunday and the, and the rum. I wouldn't drink when I was too young, but um, with, with the men and stories. It was just stories about. Yeah. And, and so that, 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 that was pretty brilliant. And I would also say dealing with the harshness of the exterior world also influenced me as a, as a political being as well as an artist mm -hmm. that 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 very much there is a wonderful I, there's a wonderful saying um in cape town there are trees that you see on on when when you land in cape town and they have no leaves just a kind of top just kind of green top and they're very slender and tall and cape town's very windy and they also you often i asked someone once i said why do those trees have no branches and they said well because they've been trimmed by the wind and um and I, I i i like to look at myself and my world and, and perceive myself as being trimmed by the wind of my home and yeah. trimmed of the wind of the time i was born into and of the location i was also born in wow yeah that's i mean what an incredible what an incredible analogy <laughs> but yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah, no, that's just that's actually taken me back a bit. <laughs> well, how lovely that is, honestly. Um, I, yeah. When they said it to me, they only said that to me this year. I was in Cape Town, I think, in, oh. in January or something. And literally, we were in the car, and they said that, and I went trimmed by the wind. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's deep. It really is. It, 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 it's it's there's a lot there's a lot of gravitas like in that in that saying, and it take it, it tells its own story in itself. Um, you know what? If I ever become a writer, um, that's what that's where I'm starting at. Um, Again, brother, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say take it, bro. Take it, bro. <laughs> but soon I'm gonna have to stop paying you. <laughs> this is too much. I don't I don't need your money. I'm in the <laughs> legacy business. When you Thank get to you. my grand old age, you're just pleased that someone young laughs at your gags or thinks that something you said is sensitive. You're like that is payment. That's payment alone. Trust me. Perfect. 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 Well, I'll keep it coming then. Um, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, so kind of just to, again, move on. Um, it's, it's honestly, like, like I said uh, in the intro, it's such an honour to be able to talk to you. Um, it's, a shame, it's a shame it's not face-to-face, -face, but, you know, this, this will have to do at the moment. But um, All good. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask if there was anyone that you looked up to or during, you know, while you were growing, if, there was, if there, you had any, like, big inspirations in your life? Um, just because I know yeah. it's an inspiration for a lot of people at the minute, so... Yes, my, 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 thank you for that. My, my, my mother was my role model and is my role model. She, she died 15 years ago, but, but, mm -hmm. still, but still is. Um, in the outside world, I would say I had three role models um, and they were all at a distance. Um, it was August Wilson, the playwright, who showed me that you didn't have to compromise your truth in order to get success. Um, yeah. he, wrote the, he wrote from a, a, a true um, Afrocentric, perspective at a, at a time when that was not allowed mm -hmm. um and, and and he wrote truth and that truth translated and uh, and 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 there was success attached so he was really he was part of my roadmap i think the other thing was muhammad ali because muhammad ali was both um magnificent at his craft and yet true to his soul yeah and i think the pursuit of being the best that you can be um, has always been something, and fulfilling my own personal potential has always been something that, that's, that's meant a lot 
to me. And then finally, I would say that it was Malcolm X um, and Malcolm X's Truth to Power um, and, and his journey traveled um, opened my eyes in a way that, that few had done before or even after. And so I would say those, those, are, those are my North Stars. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I, I completely very much relate to the Muhammad Ali, like, you know, just I'm, I'm constantly watching his fights because he's just, he's just a, he's a mega star in my eyes anyway. Um, and um, yeah, completely agree with the um, your Malcolm X comment there as well, because, you know, he is absolutely for the power of the people. And it actually kind of nicely segues into my next, my next um, topic, which isn't as nice as the previous two. Um, you know, we're, we're currently living in a, in a time where a lot of people are scared of, you know, coronavirus and catching it. And there's also um, something which is the Black Lives Matter movement, which is very much affecting a lot of us at the moment. Um, I know it's affected me very deeply in my family. Um, and I just kind of wanted to get your insight on it and your, and your opinion, um, just on kind of what's going on in the world right now in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement. I would say this, I would say I am magnificently proud of the young generation. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, young black women yes. who from the United States right to here have led wow. this movement of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. in a way that is, that is admirable and heroic and, and filled with empathy. Yeah. Our sisters are also being killed but they saw that black men are being killed in record numbers. Mm -hmm. And they also know that if we were to stand up and lead, we might also just um, create more tension. So our sisters have reached out and said, don't worry brothers, we got this. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're gonna lead this moment and mm -hmm. shout and cry yeah. for our brothers, our husbands, our uncles, our sons, and ourselves mm -hmm. and i think what that has done is that has this is my fourth round of civil uprisings i was i was there when it happened in southall in 1979 i was about 11 or 12 i don't know um i i was there during the 1980s during the brixton tox death and nationwide i was there during the back end of the 80s when we had another wave i was in baltimore in 2014 when Freddie Gray was killed and there were civil uprisings and Black Lives Matter began. I was just left the country when to the 2011 Mark Duggan uprisings yeah. happened across. And what is different about this one is that I think that what you have achieved your generation is that you have achieved for now a deeper quality of listening yeah. from our white brothers and sisters. Yeah the listening has become deeper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what we're able to do with that deeper, better quality of listening, that understanding to some degree that white supremacy in all of its manifestations has to be challenged because even if you are white, it means that you are handing that sin to your children and your grandchildren. And I think our white brothers and sisters are hearing that and going, I want to end this. I don't want this virus to pass down. I don't want it. And I think that that's what you've achieved. So this is a glorious moment. Yeah. And that for me, in that although, you know, I personally am facing a triple threat to my mortality, white supremacy, um, the financial insecurity of the theater sector, yeah. and COVID-19, yeah. that that attack on our physical, mental, and spiritual health is a lot to deal with the joy that I'm getting Mm -hmm. out of seeing that you young people, and I say again, in particular, you young black women are at the vanguard. Mm -hmm. And it makes an old man quite happy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, very much feel it myself. And I think, I mean, I couldn't have put it any better. And I don't think I'm going to even try and say anything better because yeah, it is just, you know, um, I've, I've been one that has gone on to these protests. Uh, I went to two of them in, in central London. And it is just 
when you what you're saying with um you know black women leading the march it absolutely is you know i, I saw some like some amazing and beautifully spoken black women talking about um like rising up and and, and really sticking it to it and, and just being kind of blown away and then and some of these girls were you know 19 18 17 um so i just i feel like this time feels just different and i, I definitely agree with what you're saying in terms of our white friends and brothers and sisters as well because it, it, it does feel like it's if it doesn't feel like it's just water off a duck's back this time it feels like it's actually it feels like it's moving people more than it has in the past so yeah as my muslim okay. brothers and sisters would say inshallah mm. uh, i hope that it will be so i hope yeah. it will remain so yeah. or may it remain so yeah absolutely and you you touched upon um our theaters just then as well and i actually kind of wanted to ask you a quick one about um well probably not as quick as it as i would imagine it because it is a big it's a big topic but um i was kind of you know, it's, it's, uh, especially while at drama school, um, as, as a black man that went to drama school, you always kind of wonder what the best approach on being casted in and, and exactly why you're being casted for things. And I kind of wanted to get your input on that as well, just like in, in terms of casting black people or people of color and, and also women, um, what is in your eyes kind of the, the, the best way? Because, you know, you hear all these things about all black casts to, to, to make a quota, and also, you know, basing it purely off merit. So I kind of wanted to see what you thought is the best way in, in casting these different minor, minorities. Um, I, I would say, first of all, the way that I tend to look at life is that I, I, I am not part of a minority, I'm part of a global majority. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, you know, um, an ethnic minority feels like it, it that everything that it's given by the host community, that uh, that somehow it's a gift, or somehow they have to super earn it. As part of the global majority, I believe that I'm, I'm that every story is mine. Mm -hmm. And if every story is mine, that means I should have access yeah. to 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 every role. Mm -hmm. um, and and we're living in a moment of of gender fluidity, which is kind of beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, 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 and so I think the old ways of looking at roles, like, you know, that, that's a man's role or that's a role for someone who's white is, is almost ridiculous. And I learned, it became really clear to me when I was in the States that, I, that Americans do Shakespeare really bloody well. And, um, and in, in a way, I thought it was ours until I went there and I went, oh, shit, they, they're bringing the visceral and the intelligence and they're, I'm like, yo, and, and, and they call it this. But Shakespeare was writing before the country was America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if American can play Robin Hood, you know, in a movie, yeah. then, then I, I don't understand any discussion about, mm -hmm. about anyone being cast for anything. Mm -hmm. So I think walking into every audition room, going, my job is to do the best that I can do. My job is to be, uh, is, is to make sure that I am, um, my job is to make sure that I'm the, 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 the being that, I'm um, sorry, one second, my, my son and one of his good friends have just come to the house. Thank you for the manners and respect. Thanks for coming in, everything good? Yeah, All right, brother. I'm, I'm doing a, I'm doing a, I'm actually okay, sorry, doing a live, a live thing. What do you need, son? All right, great. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, um, no problem, no problem. Uh, the, that I think what's really important is that you walk into every room and, and own it mm -hmm. and every part that's offered to you that you never think about whether I, I got it because I was uh, because I was black or I was brown or I was a woman. You got it because you want it. Yeah. You yeah. got it because it's yours. And technically you're owed anyway. There's a whole backlog of stuff of generations who didn't get to do what you're doing. So my sense is never walk into the room carrying the, or even worry that someone may think that you didn't get it on merit. There is a, a friend of mine, his, his, um, his, his father was an actor and he was becoming an actor. And he said, dad, what's the one bit of advice that you would give me? And he said, son, there are a thousand reasons why you may not get a job. Just don't let your acting be one of them. Yeah. Wow. Again, I might have to 
<laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> that was fantastic. Well, Kwame, I think I, 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 I've absolutely over to my stay in terms of my questions to you. So just honestly, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move it over to the lovely students that we also have in this uh, call as well, because I know they have, they have some burning questions for you. So um, when uh, I think they get given the go ahead, we'll, um, we'll move on to them, I think. I have Natalie with a question first. So if you want to dive straight in, I'll mute myself and let you go for it. Hello. Um, wow. It has been an absolute pleasure to listen to that. Um, and I think you partly answered my question already, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> so what would be the best advice you could give to um, an actor or a young creator that wants to produce their own work or write or just be it whatever they want to you know, do um, out of drama school, seeing as we are in crazy times and it's best to be prepared, I guess. I would say a few things, and I don't know it, that I have answered it, so thank you for asking. Um, I, I would say there were a couple of things. Number one, know yourself. Know who you are. And know what it is you want to place in the world. And then find the genre or the medium that allows you to do that. There is no such thing as a singular artist anymore. We are all gonna have to be anti-disciplinary, not even multidisciplinary. You're gonna have to walk into the room and go, hey, I've got this podcast idea and do it and find a way of doing it. And that doesn't take away from being an actor. You're gonna walk into a space and go, I've got an idea for a movie. And then you go and do it and you're gonna direct it. And you're just gonna go, that's just what I do. Why? Because this division of, of the creating a singular brand of artists um, or singular discipline about it, that, that's dead. It's not gonna work anymore. So know who you are, find your medium that expresses sometimes it's acting, sometimes it's filmmaking, sometimes it's making music. And then go, I right, now let me try and do it to the best of my ability or put myself in the environment where I can learn to fulfill my potential and then exploit that, uh, that idea that you have to the hilt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for the question, Natalie, as well. Thank you. Um, I know Georgia has a lovely question about um, like investing our energy. So if you wanted to just go on to that one, Georgia, that'd be lovely. Hi, Kwame. Hi. So my question is, while we are stuck at home during uh, COVID-19, what are some positive ways that we can invest our energy as artists? Beautiful, beautiful question. First of all, in yourself. And I know that sounds like it's just like a kind of platitude, but I, you know, I kind of, but I actually mean I've at the beginning of lockdown, um, I, I try to invest in the three R's to replenish, to reflect. And now I can't remember what the third one is. <laughs> to repeat myself. Oh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to reform actually was my, was my, was my third one and so really using this time to shore yourself up and to know who you are and what you are because it is in adversity that we often learn who we are who we truly are and what our capacity is so that would be number one number two is to use this time and everybody's going to say this to read and investigate and find and listen hard. I speak often about the quality of listening. What are you listening to? What are you listening for? As an actor, behavior is everything and you're having to learn Zoom behavior right now in a way that no generation ever had to before. And guess what? That's going to be called upon when we eventually get out of lockdown. They're gonna go, do you remember that moment when Zoom cut out? right <laughs> that you lent in and you went oh what is it what, what was that like you all just did then i went oh is it me is it my internet is it what is it there is it go, what right you've got all of these things the learning of behavior and recording of behavior is really important that you use your energy to understand that um that you're scanning right now you're tooling up 
So it's reading, listening, and using your energy to replenish yourself. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. <laughs> uh, I know Jasper has a question, if you want to go for it, Jasper. Yeah, hey, man. Um, so as a director and facilitator of theatre that has worked with a lot of youth ensembles and companies to great success, uh, Twelfth Night, which I saw being a great testament to that, uh, what advice would you give to theatre makers and owners, young and old, that are struggling to diversify um, their, the ethnic groups they get in their audition rooms, especially in community theatre? So in essence, I suppose, what can we as theatre makers do to encourage uh, young ethnic minorities or global majority performers to engage more with theatre? I think we have to love them. And I know that sounds like a really odd thing to say, but we have to love our communities. And if you love your community, you look at your community, you see them. And if you see them, hopefully then you hear them. And if you see and hear them and love them, then you're gonna want them to be around you. You're going to need for them to be around you, otherwise you will see, smell, feel a deficit. It cannot be about the intellect. It has to be about your spirit. What does your spirit demand? Your spirit demands that your rehearsal room and your stage looks like the world you want to live in or do live in. And when you see and you hear and you love, people feel seen, heard, loved, and we gravitate towards love. And so even though that sounds really esoteric, you're like, what the fuck? I asked the guy a straight question about practical shit and he started giving me some Eastern shit. But um, I, I, I think once I understand that philosophically, I then apply that practically. So my casting director, whether I'm doing something in the community or not, knows that, that, that they can't just bring a monoculture in front of me. Even if that's just black, you can't bring that monoculture because I'm going to feel the deficit. So they're now tasked with doing the work that I don't even have to think about. My room is diverse. I then task the artist who I'm speaking to to want to see the world through the lens of themselves and everybody else. And then the people watching that on stage feel that extra bit of funk and go, oh, I wonder if I should do that or I could do that. And then we do the politic. Then we demand of our theatres and we demand of our communities and we demand of our theatre makers that it be representative of the city that we live in or the country that we live in, or somewhere in between. But we no longer live in a monoculture. And our art cannot be that, nor can the staff of our buildings. Intersectionality, diversity, and neurodiversity is at the heart of theater making for the 2020s. Bless, man. Thank you. Cheers, Jasper, for that question. Thank you. Um, I believe Avi Aviv has got one. Go for it, Aviv. Hi, hello. Um, so in relation to the uh, things you said about wanting the audience to leave with something, and also about what you said in uh, about a deeper quality of listening, which truly moved me, um, I was wondering, from your perspective as a, an actor, writer, director, if you could give us advice as sort of young aspiring artists as to how do you find sort of the balance in your work between a theater that is emotionally uh, engaging and entertaining um but also is probing and sort of intellectually uh, socially politically culturally um challenging and also how much do you feel the responsibility is there on the actor and the director in sort of highlighting or selling for lack of a better word to the audience that the, the idea of themes and what you want them to leave with 
That's a very, very, very good question. And I would say I would go back to my description, my self-description in terms of being generative, interpretive and curatorial. I'm going to answer this with the curatorial hat on. And, and the curatorial answer to that is that's in diversity of programming. That, that you, you create the work that sometimes says to the audience, I want to look after your spirit and just make you laugh. But I'm not going to do that the next time in. Are you ready for the next one? Because the next one is going to slap you around the face. But I need you to trust me that I'm doing it because I love you. And then the next one after that is going to be about the mind. It's going to be the mind saying, huh, am I keeping up with what's going on in the world? And it is about keeping a diversity of uh, programming alive keeping it right at the front of your head. There is no such thing, and this is important, I think, for aspiring artists. There is no such thing as an audience. There is only audiences, multiple audiences. You yourself are not one audience. You yourself go from today, from stand-up comedy, to tomorrow, to deep ass Stanislavskian drama, to, you know, to, to an, an African spiritual, um, kind of evocation as an audience member you do that you change you change clothes and so it's really important that we understand that there are multiple audiences that demand multiple things over a period of time and if you can build enough trust so that they know that the slap in the face is going to be followed by a hug and that hug is going to be followed by a holding of your hand and marching you to Trafalgar Square to say Black Lives Matter, then I think you have a pathway. Thank you very much. Amazing. I think we have do we have a couple more. I think I can, I think we can squeeze them in because I really want to get them all all done. I'm sorry, it's me rabbiting on. Right? So, no, no, uh, no, not a problem. No, not at all. It's not at all. If anything. Um, I, I, if, I, if I just move on with it quicker, it'd be much better. But um, Izzy, if you want to go next, then that'd be amazing. Hello. Uh, I think you sort of already touched on this, but um, what has been for you your inspiration and your stimulus to write? Has it been mostly own experiences and characters from your own life, or has it been, um, I know obviously you were saying before about um, the home that you grew up in, but also the what you've, spoke about in your plays has the concepts and the morals transferred differently depending on where um it's premiered like whether it's been in baltimore whether it's been in london depending on how different cultures view it as well again uh, again your questions are, are, are great that you know we all do a thousand of these and the thing that the you know reason why we say yes is that the, just before we go in, we go, what am I doing? Who am I talking to? Why am I talking again? I'm so bored of talking to myself or about myself. And then you get asked really brilliant questions. You go, thank you. So that I would say across the board, these questions are, 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 are really reciprocal I, I'm in, in nature. Um, I would say this, I'm a very political guy. And so I, 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 I try to write fighting with the big P and the little P, literally banging at each other. Um, and when I see the big P, unless I need to kind of, I go, no, pull it down for the little P. People don't want to be lectured. And when I see the little P kind of getting small, I go, no, rise, rise up. People don't want to be patronized. People want to hear truth. And I allow those two things to dance with each other often, which is why writing is so exhausting. Because <laughs> I'm fighting, I'm going, no, oh, you, no, you, no, no, you. But ultimately, I have a political thing within whether I am, what, whichever way I'm doing my art. There is something that I want to say. I do not believe in art that just sits within the narrow bandwidth of entertainment. It is too special, the gift that we have. It is too hard to do what we do. It is too costly to our souls to just be there only for entertainment. We have to be there for, I hope, to incrementally make the world a better place. Ultimately, that is my aim when I create art, which is to contribute to the, to the forward motion of our empathy. 
And so sometimes that's borrowed from my background, but you get to about, by the time you get to your third play, if you're still just mining uh, your own personal experience, it gets hard. What, what you actually need to start doing is taking your personal experience and just letting that be a springboard for empathy into others, into other worlds and finding the world that, that, that says the thing that you want it to say. So I, I, I would say that our job as artists is to uh, create the work, and I know I said this at the beginning, create the world that we want to see. And sometimes that's mining the interior, and sometimes it's, uh, it's flying to the moon and looking back down. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, if Brianna, do you want to give your question real quick? Hi, Kwame. So lovely to see you, kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I would love to give my question. I also want to say a really big quick thank you, because I actually used a piece from Fix Up to get into mm -hmm. Malview. So that's a quick just thank you so much for writing it. It was brilliant. Um, so my question is, do you have any plans to involve more black drama students and graduates in any upcoming shows in the future? Obviously, once we can get back to being in theatres for real. What a brilliant question. It would be wrong to not do a bit of advocation, right? Going, yo, bring us through, yo. It's hard out here. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I, I appreciate you. And I appreciate you referencing Bitter Herb. Um, you know, I, let me just be really honest. I don't know, right? I don't, I, I don't know when we're going to reopen. We're fighting really hard. I don't know what the framework of the plays that we're going to be, to, you know, framework of the plays that we're going to be able to fit within. I don't know. Here's what I do know, is that um, there's not a director alive who doesn't need the vitality and the energy of the recently graduated actor. There's not an older actor who doesn't need to be in a room learning from you, learning from your optimism, learning from sometimes your freshness, learning from, your, uh, from your, the dreams that you have and the way that you as a young generation are negotiating. It used to be separate to be political and to be an artist it used to be separate. Now I see on people see these all the time. I'm an activist. I'm a, you know, actor and activist. We, we're doing it. It's part, we're not afraid to say that we wear our politics. You're not afraid to say that you're wearing your politics as part of your art. It doesn't only define you, but it is part of you. And that, I'm telling you, means that we are going to need you. We're going to need you for the work that is going to come from this moment. So I, I would love to say, yes, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and I'll be lying. And I'm not here <laughs> to lie to you, but I am here to say that I need you and that we need you and that everyone in the game is really aware, or everybody who's a gatekeeper is really aware of the cost of COVID on the young actor right now. And your job is to start when we're back in, you know, use your letter writing and your email power to keep saying to us, don't forget about us. Don't forget. We, we, got, we, 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 we got shit we got to do, and it got delayed. Don't forget about us. Amazing, thank you so, so much. <laughs> Amazing, thank you, Brianna. Um, and last, and definitely, certain, certainly not least, who I have on my, my list just here is Elliot. I think you have a question as well, mate? Yeah, go for it. Yes, I do. Firstly, Kwame, Thank you for existing. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, because um, I really enjoy the Young Vic's like reimaginings of, of plays of the classic canon. Um, I was wondering, how do you decide which of those stories are like the most suited and accessible to a contemporary audience, or how do you make them so? I think that's a very, again, I keep saying that. I've got to find a different way of saying it. A really wonderful question. Um, and, and I would say, very interestingly, I think that's the theatre that I inherited. I inherited a theatre that, and David Ann did a magnificent job of taking European classics and reinventing them for the here and now. I would say that's not what I want to do with the Young Vic. Um, and the reason I say I do, I do not want to do that with the Young Vic is, and, and forgive this as a slight rant, is that I, my job 
and, and this is not a critique of your question because your question is wonderful. But my job, as I see it, is not to be the colored version of the thing that went before me. My job is to, uh, is to reimagine the world through my lens. And then when I stop being the artistic director, the next artistic director will interpret the, the lens through her lens. Um, and so uh, for me, one of the very interesting things is, one of the pillars of white supremacy is high culture. High culture has excluded us. It lets us into popular culture because they go, don't worry, that's disposable. But high culture, the thing that studies, that tells us who we are at our soul, um, we have been excluded from that. And so my emphasis actually is trying to find the work that doesn't just celebrate European, the European canon, but is to extend that canon. And sometimes extending that canon is a new place. Sometimes extending that canon is in new ways of treating old plays. Some way it's looking to an international or foundational text from across the world. But ultimately, my game is to find a way to, to breathe legitimate life into the canon so that actually I'm never a visitor. I'm there on my own terms as a diasporic African. And I'll just, I, I, I'll bore you one, one last story. It was one of the things that influenced me the most. I think I was directing Comedy of Errors. I think it was at The Public in New York. And, um, and, and, and you know, one of my problems with Shakespeare that I, that I had for a long time is that there is a, there is a, and a privilege that's attached to that, a class privilege that is often attached to Shakespeare that slightly winds me up. And, and, you know, and so if I've been to the right schools, with the right education, that means this is probably the eighth time I've seen Comedy of Errors, as opposed to the first time that I've seen it. And I wanted to privilege other people. So at the time when I did it, trap music was the new big thing. And the big tune at the time was a tune called Lit Light Bick, which I loved so much. It went, Lit Light Bick. And, um, and so I was like, yeah, excuse my rendition. It doesn't sound anything like that, but alas. Um, um, so I, I, I wanted, when the audience walked in, I wanted my actors to be playing instruments. And so they started playing lit like this, but on like on a xylophone, on a flute, on traditional instruments. And what was really interesting, the school party came in and they sat on the left bank. And on the right bank was a, a group of what I might call our traditional theater audiences, you know, 50 plus, possibly white, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and of course they walked in going, yeah, I've seen it a million times. Let me see the new thing that you're gonna do with it. And I imagine that the school group had not seen it that many times. But what happened is when they sat down is they heard da, 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 da. And that played with the actors playing it for about five minutes. And they went, and I heard someone say, Yo, isn't that lit like bit? And the other kid said, yeah. And they started singing along with it. And the older traditional audience was like going, what the fuck are they talking about? And so the people who were privileged at that moment were the young people that it was brought to them, not to our traditional audience. That doesn't mean I want to alienate our traditional audience, but I want to realign privilege. Does that answer that question? Yes, yes, thank it's you. It's a long way around. Yeah. Sorry, brother. No, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, guys. And I, I mean, that's a, that's, I think that's a great question to end it on, actually. Um, and just, I just want to actually just like give a shout out to everyone that joined this um, call today. Thank you so much for coming up with the questions as well, because these guys, Kwame, are so busy at the minute because they're all currently still at Mount View, like slugging away. So um, thank you for taking the time out of your day, guys, to do that. I really appreciate all of you individually. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, bless my sister went to Mount View. She was an actor. She's no longer an actor. She's a drama therapist now. So oh. um, and it was it was when the in the old school in Wood Green. Yeah. And I used to live uh, around the corner from there. You and did. so uh, and in fact, I still do now, but just in a different direction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 so I have such fond memories of Mount View that even though we're all in Zoom hell, that when I was asked, I had to say yes. So yeah. thank you for taking the time out of your mad schedule 
and uh, and coming to spend a little time with this old man.